tonight on Person in Person. Dick the Halls, Belgium. Come fly with me, let's float down to Tampa. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Planet of the Marmosets. Mr. Jones and me, getting frickin' paralyzed. Not so special K. All these stories plus weather, sports, food crime, a dad tantrum, and a getting personal interview. That's tonight on Person in Person. Good evening, wherever you are, whoever you are, and welcome to Person in Person. I'm Gene Person. And I'm Greg Person. No relation. Person in Person is a news show for people who don't like news shows, by people who don't like news shows. A change to our format this week, we're test driving condensing world news and main news into one news segment. Tell us if you prefer this or the old way. Your opinion matters. We don't believe in states and borders, and we don't think the news should have them either. However... It is main news. Our first story tonight, Dick the Halls. The Belgian town of Udenburg installed some holiday lights, as you do come this time of year. The lights were apparently meant to resemble candles with a long white shaft and a bulbous violet flame. You see what's coming here? Uh, I hope it's not literally coming. That sounds like a fire hazard. But yes, they put up over 90 Christmas dick orations. Every last one looked like a phallus. Shots of the Jolly Johnsons went viral online, and ultimately, the mayor made a public apology. So first question, is this really the most offensive thing about Christmas? Like, don't get me wrong, I hate seeing unsolicited penis as much as the next girl, but I think the idea of, of burning fuel to display just how brightly you love Christmas is, is far more offensive in these times. Well, but I, how else are people going to show that they love Christmas? As we approach Christmas, we turn into rabid, card-charging robots, trampling each other for a few dollars off a fucking Acer laptop. Weapons drawn when anyone deigns to ask us why we aren't wearing a mask. But a light sculpture of a candle that looks like the nose of a proboscis monkey is the problem? I don't think so. Now, this was in the town of Utenberg, is that correct? Yeah, something like that. Am I am I correct in uh, the reports that I've heard that these decorations were also seen not only by three men, but also a baby? Is Oh, Gutenberg. Got it. Yeah, yeah. See, I was thinking of Steve Gutenberg. Yeah, yeah. Utenberg, very different from Gutenberg. And it's Udenberg with a D, as in dick. An important hmm. note, the light-up dicks are missing jingle balls. If the balls aren't there, are they really dicks? Not that you need to have the testicles to have a penis, but you're going to have a difficult time singing Oh Come All Ye Faithful when you're not producing any. Yum nuts, anyone? Oh, now you had to bring up the yum nut. I had to. The holiday treat nobody asked for. Right. You know, though, if you, if you look at a yum nut, it does seem like it might be the exact right dimensions for an electric dick. Well, maybe we found the uh, the missing socket for this particular key. Well, we saved Christmas again, Gene. All in a day's work. So, a private company in Florida is building a hub for flying cars in central Florida in the hopes that in five years they'll be <laughs> carrying passengers from Orlando to Tampa in a half hour. You know, the dream of man since <laughs> the beginning of flight. Now, I do want to say... You know how I feel about flying cars. I do. They are possibly the, it's the dumbest bullshit ever conceived of. But if you are going to follow up this bad idea, if you're going to spend presumably millions of dollars to try and do this, please, for the love of God, don't do it in Florida. Bad things happen in Florida for reasons that we can't precisely explain. It's like the Bermuda Triangle. Any enterprise that begins in Florida is doomed to failure. Except Disney World. It's it's interesting that you, you throw that out there. They do have uh, flying squirrels in Florida. Why not flying cars? Hmm. Well, um, because if a flying squirrel gets hit by another flying squirrel, all he gets is a nasty bump on the noggin. But if this flying squirrel gets sucked into your jet intake, you're going down. Oh, that's a fair point. Do you think that... Do you think that ever happens, though? Mid-air collisions between flying squirrels? I'm I'm sure it does. I, I I think they've they've got a level of of grace that you know your common human being doesn't. But 
I think there's still going to be accidents, right? Right. And then, and then they both just go down and then they have to exchange insurance information and right. It's a whole thing. But, and here's my other question though, is that, so the Orlando to Tampa route, which I'm sorry, I can't stop laughing when I say this, but it's never not funny to me. The Orlando to Tampa route is the only route they're going to be able to do uh, because the maximum range of this thing is only 185 miles. So no matter what direction you go in, you're still going to be in Florida. Right. Still stuck in Florida, the Estonia of non-Michigan America. Now, as I'm not an expert on Florida, except I'm, I'm gradually becoming an expert because so many of our great news stories originate there. But is the Orlando to Tampa route so busy that you, you need this whole new technology to get people there quickly? I, I don't know that it is. I have a thought about um, still being in Florida after traveling all that distance. I wonder if maybe it's just like they're, they're incapable of imagining leaving Florida. Maybe they're like frogs in a pot of water that's just being slowly heated and they're just used to it. Well, with the, the heat and the humidity and, and the swampiness of it, I feel like the, the analogy is particularly apt. I just, it makes me so sad to think of a human being who, in theory, your mind is capable of conceiving anything, that your horizons get narrowed down so far that you're just like, <laughs> man, fuck, I wish I could just go to Tampa. You know, if only I could get to Tampa or like, <laughs> what's, what's the situation now? Do you just hop in a cab and you're like, I need to get to Tampa now, <laughs> you know, and and you know you're in a you're in a car and you're like oh fuck I'll never get to Tampa in time. There's got to be a better way. Well, there is a better way. Flying cars. There's, there's nothing waiting for you in Tampa. Please don't get into this flying death trap. I, I really feel like the, the Jetsons was missing out on one core component, and that is Podunk technology. So I think the Jetsons from Florida is basically the Flintstones. All right. So what's our next story? Our next story comes from overseas. They're coming to get you, Barbara. So those kooky Danes over in Copenhagen decided they need to kill 10 million minks over fears the animals would retransmit a new strain of the coronavirus to humans, which is horrible. But then, when the minks were dumped into a mass grave, the cadavers reemerged from the earth, rising, ministers say, through five feet of soil, lifted by pressure from decomposition gases as if propelled upward by some force beyond life with an untamable hunger for human flesh which just goes to show you fight one outbreak you get another you want to go hide out in the mall well as long as there's no fur coats in there yeah you kill that many animals you are asking for some kind of comeuppance and in this case a literal comeuppance right and you know this is another one of those stories where it's real, it happened to you, but no one's ever going to believe it was even possible. You're going to have PTSD from the time all the minks rose screaming from the earth, and everyone's going to think that you're you're lying to them. It's not fair. I, I feel genuinely bad for whoever had to witness this. Another fun fact, and by fun I mean heartbreaking and infuriating... Uh, Denmark is the world's largest exporter of mink fur, uh, an industry that absolutely deserves to still exist in these modern times because human beings are fucking monsters. The government concluded last week they didn't even need to kill all of these animals. The so-called threat had passed with no new cases of the mutated virus. So it was, we're not going to check on it or anything, but just to be safe, let's kill 10 million <laughs> of these animals. Yeah, absolutely. One final point, if a human being is willing to wear the carcass of a rodent simply because it's expensive, don't they honestly deserve a little bit of coronavirus? Just a little bit as a treat. Yeah, just, it's like a... For us, not for them. It's like a bonus tie-in. You buy the mink, you get the coronavirus. Honestly, you know, fur isn't murder yet, but it could be. We'll keep our fingers crossed. There's a joint team of German and Japanese scientists that injected a uniquely human gene that they believed was responsible for human brain development into some marmoset fetuses. And sure enough, they did see significant growth in the neocortex, uh, which is the 
uh, more advanced part of the brain involved in decision making and abstract thinking. And uh, the brains increased in mass and, and got a bit more wrinkly. Marmosets with human brains. Now, for those of you who can't picture a marmoset, it's like a little happy, goofy looking monkey. These ones they they had given human brains to. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying this, you know, so if anybody wants to come at me over this sentiment, you know, you got the wrong guy because I am explicitly not saying this, but... German and Japanese scientists are teaming up to do super science and nobody's going to say anything, really? Well, as you know, Greg, it's been well over a year since the end of World War II. I say let bygones be bygones. <laughs> I don't I don't know, man. I mean, it's just some things, you know, it's like forgive, but maybe keep one eye open. And uh, I, it just it just makes me nervous, you know. So far, there's no Gundams and no Kaiju or anything, so that's cool. No Death Rays. Right. But um, I am a little bit nervous about Monkey Super Soldiers. Well, and plus, I think our old friend Ian Malcolm might have some words about this particular situation. This is uh, your scientists were so busy thinking about whether they could, they didn't stop to think if they should, if I ever heard. Yeah, for sure. But they say that they didn't allow any of the marmoset fetuses to actually come to term. But here's the thing, and this is related to my first point. I don't believe them. <laughs> because <laughs> if you... Well, no. Because if you have the ability to create a monkey with human neural architecture, you want to see what that's like. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I want to see what it's like, and I think this experiment's an offense against God. I still want to see it. And if you offered me the chance to have one of these super intelligent monkeys... Of course I'm going to take it. Well, I mean, how could you pass that up? Right. We all saw that movie with James Franco and Andy Serkis. You know, he kidnaps the chimp. The chimp is super intelligent. I forget what happens after that. But up until that point, it was a pretty heartwarming movie. And here's the other thing that uh, was a little chilling. Um, it doesn't have to be primates. They can actually achieve the same effect in studies on mice and ferrets. And... They found that they can cause the gene to overexpress for even bigger gains. So you can do it to, so far as we know, any mammal or any animal. So I mean, sharks maybe. I don't know if you remember that one. Could be, could be spiders. The the thing that was interesting to me is if you can cause this gene to overexpress in mice for sick brain gains, you can do it in humans. So. They might have stumbled backwards into a limitless drug that's not just a metaphor for cocaine. Right, Breaking Bad for biologists. And and I tell you, if that comes on the market, I'm not taking it. You'll have to hold me down to give me that shit. Because if there's one thing I've learned about intelligence, it will not make you one bit happier. Well, right. Look at uh, Ozymandias from, uh, from the Watchmen comic. So, Ian Jones, a British father and former healthcare worker was in India for a few months for a humanitarian organization trying to help people get out of poverty. During that time, he caught malaria and then dengue fever. He survived and then caught COVID-19. And then, while fighting COVID-19, got bitten by a snake. Not just any snake, a black king cobra. He's now battling both paralysis and blindness. Amazingly, Mr. Jones is likely to survive. Now, I'm not going to comment on the spread of disease because we're a first world country and we're doing a terrible job. But by the same token, hey, at least we don't have King Cobras hiding all over. Not yet. Yeah. I assume that's the next big innovation coming from Florida. And I know this is a podcast of questions, but I had questions and here are some answers. The King Cobra snake is not the most venomous animal in the world, but the payload of venom in one bite is often enough to kill 20 people. It's a cocktail of cytotoxins and neurotoxins, meaning it both attacks the nervous system and destroys your cells, often with uh, cardiotoxic effects. Symptoms include severe pain, blurred vision, vertigo, drowsiness, and paralysis initially. And if left untreated, that progresses into cardiovascular collapse and coma, followed by death due to respiratory failure. This can sometimes happen within 30 minutes. Shit. Immediate treatment is often required to avoid death, 
The untreated fatality rate is 50 to 60%. The treated fatality rate is 28%. That's not great. Do not get bit by a king cobra. I'm going to do my best starting now. That's, I mean, it's a little early to call it, but I think that's my New Year's resolution. (laughs) Right, right. Mr. Jones, if you ever do visit America, I can't stress this enough. Do not go to Florida. Do not visit any private zoos. And whatever you do, do not pay $150 for a close encounter with a leopard. I think all three of those are just good, solid rules for literally anyone. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the kind of rules that I'm trying to impart on little Gene as he grows. Now, I will say, as you were telling this story, one bright spot did occur to me. All right, let's hear it. We have conclusive proof that there is a God who sees us and takes an active interest in in the affairs of individual humans. It's not what I would call a healthy interest, but clearly he's up there and he's got it in for some people. Sure, sure. You know, his parents named him Ian, but God named him Job. Sometimes you just got to pull the wings off a fly to let the other flies know that you're still there. So speaking of limitless drugs, uh, police in Thailand were very excited to report recently that they'd seized a warehouse full of ketamine based on a tip Um, Someone had called them and let them know that there was a a boat coming in from Taiwan with uh, piles and piles of ketamine. So they seized this warehouse. They held a triumphant press conference in front of their 11 and a half tons of industrial cleanser. (laughs) You know, uh, Greg, one night in Bangkok makes a hard mess tidy. Curse you for bringing that song back to the popular consciousness. I'm going to... I'm going to hammer on this one week after week. You know, a friend of mine once observed that um, One Night in Bangkok was um, was sort of the exact opposite of the Donna Summer song, I Feel Love, because I Feel Love would be relevant forever and ever, and One Night in Bangkok was dated instantly <laughs> the second it was I mean, it's recorded. Not- it's not wrong. No, I thought that was like one of the most trenchant observations I've ever heard about anything, honestly. I, I just feel like it's probably the single greatest pop song, pop rock song ever written about a chess tournament. <laughs> yes, that is absolutely unassailably <laughs> true. There there are no better pop songs about chess tournaments. But the thing about the the uh, police in Thailand seizing all this industrial cleanser. You got to do the testing before you do the press conference. Right. This is the shoes before pants of drug busts. Like, that's rule number one. What is the uh, Thai word for keystone? Oh, I could have looked that up. I don't even know the Thai word for cop. I was going to look that up and forgot. But it's for the best because I don't want to mangle the beautiful Thai language and... Uh, suddenly find out that a bunch of people in Thailand have opinions about our show. So I will say though, to the people of Thailand, I am very heartened to see how stupid your cops are. Um, The fact that cops are stupid everywhere gives us hope for the future because yes, they have all the tools, they have all the money, they have unlimited license to do whatever they want, but they're, they're not as smart as you. Whoever you are, however dumb you are, you're smarter than them. And you're going to be okay. Here's the message to the uh, guy whose warehouse they raided. Dude, if you're listening, you should start smuggling massive amounts of drugs immediately. Because they're not going to tap that well again. Right, because now they've got, they've got like, stupidity immunity. They, they were burned on your warehouse before. Lightning is not going to strike twice in this case. You import all the ketamine you want, brother. You know, whatever whatever flavor you want to get into, they are not going to come for you. So, uh, you know, good luck in your future business ventures. I hope you rake in massive profits. All right, moving on to the weather. How was your Thanksgiving, Greg? Uh, well, it was uh, pretty chill. It was just me and the dog. And uh, we had some ham. We had a little stovetop stuffing and uh, some whole cranberry sauce. I, I don't mind the jelly, but I do like to have those whole berries up in there. And of course, I'm not going to sure. make my own because it's not really possible to make cranberry sauce for just one person. I mean, other than that, pretty low key. How was yours? Oh, it was great. I, uh, I cooked a bird for uh, the very first time, prepared it. It was well seasoned. It was moist. 
It was really good. Who would have thought that Penguin turned out to be such a great Thanksgiving feast? Well, yeah, they're naturally seasoned because they spend all their time in the seawater eating those fish, right? So their aquatic habitat was one of the reasons it was so moist. I didn't actually eat a penguin. I made a turkey, but... Well, those are the penguins of the land, right. certainly. Right. You know, if there's one thing they say about turkey, is it's, it's very like penguin. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, they're, they're large, flightless birds. Um, right. They steal each other's eggs, and a lot of them are gay. Which is all you need to know. Speaking of eggs... Uh, I believe tonight's food crime story has something to do with eggs. Tonight, as most nights, Greg Person has the story. Well, this is the story of, and you folks out there might remember this, because when this product first came on the scene several years ago, it did create a bit of a stir. Um, In uh, one of my favorite product reviews of all time, uh, writing for The Guardian, Reek Samatter called it a horrifying, unholy affair. It's the Raleigh Egg Master. Oh, the Rolly Egg Master. Yeah, that's the egg pooper. Um, you may have already read reviews of this or seen videos of it in action on YouTube, in which case you have my sincerest condolences. Um, if you've never heard of it before, this is one of those infomercial products that uh, solves a problem nobody has with a product nobody asks for. What it is, it's a cross between a thermos and a fleshlight. But that hole in the middle is hot enough to boil an egg, so don't get any ideas. Um, you just you lube it up with some nonstick spray, you crack in a couple of chicken periods, and in a couple of minutes, it's going to start smelling like burning plastic and sulfur. That's when you know it's ready. And then it's going to... The, the only verb to describe this accurately, and I'm sorry to our listeners, it shits out an egg tube which is the worst looking thing you've ever seen. Um, I, it would never even occur to me that, that this thing that comes out of this would be edible. And by all accounts, it's not. Uh, but the thing about this product that's always fascinated me is that what this is intended to replace, the backbreaking culinary labor that it's going to relieve you of, <laughs> is boiling an egg. Which is, it's simple. It's the simplest thing. It's literally, if you can do that, you can make at least one wholesome, delicious food stuff. Right. I literally know six-year-olds who can do this and come out with a perfect hard-boiled egg every like, time. Eggs in general are, are pretty easy unless you're poaching, which this trinket doesn't even do. But eggs are absolutely easy. They are over easy. Mm-hmm. 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 So I have one, one question for you, Greg. We're... Uh, Were people Mm -hmm. scrambling to purchase this? There's going to be a lot more egg puns, aren't there? I'm having an excellent time. Shall we continue? I'll tell you what. I love it. Ah! Uh, Ah, see, that's that's one for our listener in France. We know you're out there. We have the analytics. I'm I'm sorry that I attempted to speak one word of French. I know how it offends you. (laughs) But I did want to give you a hearty bienvenue. Welcome to our show. Sacred Blue. Nope, nope. Now we're canceled in France. Good job. Those people don't mess around. They're lighting cops on fire right now, and God bless them. So I'm, I'm not ready to get on the bad side of the French. On to our next segment, Dad Tantrum. All right, tonight I'm going to be telling the story of Blippi. A comedian named Stephen John witnessed his two-year-old nephew watching lo-fi YouTube vids and had the idea of starting a higher-quality experience for kids, claiming to be inspired by Mr. Rogers and the like. He launched a career that would earn him 10.45 million subscribers and a net worth of $40 million. First point, I take exception to his name. Not Blippi, that's fine. He was born Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, and he changed it to Stephen, S-T-E-V-I-N. I don't know why I feel so strongly about this, but I just don't think he should have done that. Yeah, it's weird that you would have an opinion on that at all, I have no idea why. Blippi videos purport to be educational for kids, but really consist of him running around play centers and trampoline parks, pointing out colors kids at this stage of development already know, and counting to three. I mean, he does do a little more than that, but certainly nowhere near as much as other programming already does. What's more, because he takes on the persona of a grown-up who talks and acts like a child, doesn't even model good behavior, 
verbally or through the choices his character makes. I'm not kidding. There's an episode where he goes to the aquarium and he pretends like he's going to jump into the water with the sharks. Like it's all a big funny bit. The thing is, kids don't have that off switch. If if they're going to pretend to jump in with the sharks and they are as young as the videos his or as the kids his videos are supposed to be serving are, they're just going to jump. So you're saying we might see some sharks get harambe Mr. John has done some truly tasteless and, and reprehensible things, including another YouTube series with a character named Steezy Grossman, who apparently, on video, was depicted as defecating on a naked friend. He later said he regretted it and had the videos removed through DMCA takedowns, but he did it in the first place. He's also launched a tour and sold tickets for, like, huge sums of money, but the performer on the tour wasn't actually Stephen John. It was a Blippi impersonator. So he's selling tickets saying Blippi's going to be there. And then he hires a Blippi double. He said it was explicitly stated in the posters that it was, a, it was not actually Blippi. But even still, you know, kids see that Blippi's going on tour. They're going to be harassing their parents nonstop about that. The parents shell out hundreds of dollars for these tickets. And then it's not even Blippy. Was there a reason this guy couldn't do the tour himself? Or did he just not feel like it and figure he could get paid either way? You know, I didn't see anything that specifically stated the reason. But the Excavator song is kind of a banger, though. There's one thing that we can take away from this story. It's that Stevens are bullshit. Agreed. On to sports. This week, we're launching a new sports bracket the Christmas movie bracket. And what we want to do, rather than just running with this whole thing ourselves, is have you suggest your favorite Christmas movie. Over the next four weeks, we're going to run the bracket until there is a clear winner. Suggestions can be tweeted to us at Anchor Persons or emailed to personandpersonshow at gmail.com. We would love to hear your suggestions. Please don't let any Christmas movie get left behind. We want to make sure that people know... We take a very broad view of what counts as a Christmas movie. Is Gremlins 2 a Christmas movie? Absolutely. Gremlins 1 is a Christmas movie. Any Gremlins movie is a Christmas movie. So, so folks, if the movie takes place around Christmas time and features Gremlins, it's on the table. Now for this week's featured sport, Greg. Shin kicking. Oh, finally. Now, yeah, yeah, that's right. We're, we're finally going to tackle this one. I thought we might have to do it as a two-parter, but I think we can condense it all down to one. <laughs> well, I, you know, I was just thinking what this world needs is a, another sport for playground bullies. Well, this is a traditional English sport, which is no better than we can expect from that cursed island. What we do in this sport, the rules, can you can you guess roughly how they go, what the object of the game is? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it involves kicking shins. I'm just going out on a limb here. You know, somehow you nailed it. What they do is they stuff their pant legs with straw, they grab each other by the collar, and then they just kick each other in the shins until one of them cries off. Um, Steel-toed boots used to be allowed, but they're not anymore. And um, you go best six out of ten rounds. Wow, that's a lot of shin kicking. Per competitor. Yeah, so you're going to be kicking the same guy in the shins a lot. You're basically going to be spending all day kicking each other in the shins. And the straw down the pant legs, which is the only sort of approved padding, not like the best Yeah, I was going to say, how much straw are they pushing down there? How much can you, you know, realistically fit? I'd be buying some oversized pants if I were going to be uh, playing some shin kicking. Oh, and they definitely do. I mean, if you look at uh, pictures of this, let's go ahead and call it a sport since it's in the sports section. Uh, they're they're definitely overstuffing the pant legs with straw. Uh huh. But this is this is one of those. See, because I love sports, I genuinely do. Because sports are about people perfecting an art, pushing their their bodies and minds to master something that is not strictly speaking necessary to survival or even very useful. It's just something that they want to do. Sports is art this i i don't know yeah i'm gonna i'm not gonna go so far as to say that there is no art to shin kicking i'm just saying it's not exactly the the sistine chapel right it's definitely not it's not even as impressive as chess boxing (laughs) 
Because at least with chess boxing, there are like requirements that have to be met. Right. And frankly, chess boxing takes skill. You have to be right. both a pretty good boxer and a pretty good chess player. Like, and, and both of those, they take time and training and work and thought. Right. And then there's, and then there's shin kicking. You just kick some shin. Right. That's the, the other end of the spectrum. It's like, what's, what's the highest, most elevated sport? I don't know. But I've, I've got a contender for lowest, least elevated <laughs> sport. So truly, England is the Florida of Europe. Scotland, Wales, you guys, you're not involved in this. This is England's problem. England is to Estonia as Florida is to Michigan. Exactly. And once again, Estonia, I'm sorry we go so hard on you. You just, you had a couple of goofy stories in a row and we had to go for it. This week, we have a getting personal interview and Greg, your wish is coming true. Mrs. G person is going to be on the show. Let's, let's listen to the interview. With me in the studio tonight is Gil Person often referred to as Mrs. Jean Person and the mother of little Jean Person. Thanks for joining us, Gil. Jean, we've been over this. It's Jill with a G. Now, Gil, if you'll permit me, I'd like to present the following questions given to me by my dear friend, Greg Person, given to him by his dear friend, James Lipton, and given to him by his dear friend, Bernard Pivo, who found them carved in a cave in Israel. What is your favorite word? Well, Jean, my favorite word is little Jean. I mean, how do you not love little Jean? You're making a lot of assumptions here. I, I, I love little Jean very much. Which is why everyone should love little Jean. I just love him. What's your least favorite word? Ugh. That's, uh, what, what, what's the definition of Ugh. You know, when you're on a long car trip... And then the road starts getting a little wobbly, and you just feel like, Bleh! Have you been dosing with LSD on car trips? Have you never heard of motion sickness? Is that a side effect of LSD? I think between the two of us, I'm not the one who's had LSD, Gene. Permission to treat the witness as hostile, Your Honor? What turns you on? Gene, it's you. What sound do you love? Meow. So you're a big fan of cats? Well, I mean, you could call it cats, but I think there's a different word for it. Have you seen the movie Cats? I can't say that I have. I I am a fan of pussy, though. That sounds like a subject better suited for one of our pop quizzes. What sound do you hate? The sound that our cat makes when it's trying to get a hairball up. <laughs> I'm not here to critique your impressions. What is your favorite curse word? Oh, f- marmalade. Have Have you spent any time in the United States Navy? Well, Jean, I think you do recall that prior to our marriage, I had a wealth of experience in all sorts of different ways. I mean, I've known many seamen and have gotten my feet wet in many places. You could say that my down under is just moist from all of the um, different things I've been into. A storied existence. What profession other than yours would you like to attempt? Well, you know, when I was a child, I wanted to be an actress. And for a long time, I thought that that's what I was actually going to do. But Then I came to the realization that I would never be any better than community theater. And that's where I left it. Well, if you hadn't passed away, I might have had my friend uh, Greg Person introduce you to his friend James Lipton. When did Greg pass away? You didn't tell me about this. Delightful. What uh, profession would you not like to participate in? Podcast. It's a pretty thankless job. I agree. We are the real heroes. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive? Oh, that answer will always be the same. Jill, you were always right. So there would be someone named Jill with you. Interesting. Hey, thank you so much for joining us, Gil. I think our 
Listeners will find this interview both edifying and uplifting. Gene, it's Jill with a G. Back to you, Greg. You know, uh, Gil has, I would have to say, a very appealing voice, far more than either of us, certainly more than me. So if you just want to replace me on the show and have her on full time, I absolutely get it. Well, I understand that, Greg, and I appreciate that. She, it's true. Her voice is magic. It is wonderful. You heard the things she could do with just one little whisper. But when it comes down to it, this is my one break from being a dad and a partner. And uh, I'm not willing to give that up just yet. Well, I'm glad you're still a partner to me in this one narrow sense only. You know, a lot of a lot of people don't know this. Here's a little bit of person and person trivia. We don't speak outside of the show. Well, why would we? No, that's, I mean, if talking is the show, why would we want to talk if it's not being recorded? We don't want to waste the magic. Right, exactly. Our final segment tonight, as every week, is Person to Person and Person, where we share your valuable feedback with our audience. This week, a listener broke in our voicemail number, though oddly, not with a voicemail, but instead a text message. So, now we know. You can send text messages to our voicemail line. Still, I want to thank you so much. Our new favorite listener wrote, Hello, who is this? And in answer to that question, it's us, Greg and Gene Person. In addition, we have our first Apple Podcasts review. A listener named Sifcon writes, News gives me anxiety. This does not. I find the show genuinely entertaining and informative in a way that gives me the news I want. The emotional weather speaks to me, and I can't get enough about Little Gene. Cool your jets, Sifcon. Little Gene has a mom. Right. And in lieu of uh, any listener feedback, I want to give a shout out to one of our listeners, the one in California. Um, we know who you are. We have the analytics. You've been faithfully downloading and listening to every episode so far. And we just want to say, you know, you're fan number one right now. You're president of the fan club. So if you want to reach out, call, text, email us. We'll, uh, we'll put you on the show. We can even do a whole thing with you if you want to do that, just to be part of this match. So our one listener in California who, is, who has tore through six episodes of the show in record time. Seriously. Yeah, we appreciate you. Give us a call. You. you know, tell us what you like about the show. Review us on, uh, you know, iTunes or your, your uh, podcast app of choice, because the reviews really help. Um, actually, that leads us into the thing that we do at the end of every episode where you tell people how to get in touch with us and rate and review and subscribe and all that. That's right. There's so many ways for you to get yourself heard. Send us an email, personandpersonshow at gmail.com. Drop us a voicemail, 541-249-5933. Find us on Twitter, at Anchor Persons, and on Facebook, at Person and Person Show. Find us on your favorite podcatchers. Please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast or simply tell a friend. Also, check out our new website, personandpersonshow.com, where you can find blog posts by Gene and Greg, as well as the full episodes. Until next time, this is Gene Person saying, should always end a comedy set with a callback. This is Greg Person saying, you don't need to go to Tampa. Good night. <laughs> Another interesting fact is uh, fishes can breathe underwater because of their gills. You know what? You know what, Gene? This is it. You're sleeping on the couch. Well, I don't know what I said that upset her so much, but I, I guess it was a brig too far. <laughs>